dear minister, dear state secretary, your excellencies, dear assistant minister, dear rector, colleagues and friends, dear Circle U friends and partners. Welcome to the University of Belgrade in the year when we celebrate 215th anniversary of the University of Belgrade. We are very proud to host the Circle U conference, climate change and student entrepreneurship from academia to policy. It is a great pleasure to host you here at Kapetan Misha's mansion, a place which has hosted many academics, celebrities, presidents, prime ministers, professors, and scientists. From Nikola Tesla, who stood on this very place, and Milutin Milanković, whose salon is next to this ballroom, to Novak Djokovic in the present day. A place that has been the home of the rectorate of the University of Belgrade for 160 years another anniversary that we will celebrate this year. During three days, the University of Belgrade will be the host for more than 190 guests from 17 countries. And I would like to wish you all a pleasant stay and successful work. Now, I would like to ask Rector, Professor Dr. Vladan Djokic, to say a few words and open the national conference. Rector. Good morning to everybody. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you on the behalf of the University of Belgrade and to wish you successful meetings in the next couple of days. Uh, uh, okay, uh, I'm very glad uh, that we have here today with us the Minister of the Government of the Republic of Serbia. Uh, we have the State Secretary, we have the Assistant of Minister, and of course we have uh, partners from the Circle U community from all partners university uh, from our alliance. Uh, welcome to the University of Belgrade. Uh, as you hear, we will celebrate this year 215 years from the beginning of higher education in our country, and this is this conference is, we say, the part uh, of this uh, great and very important for us uh, occasion. Allow me to start by saying how strongly I believe that the European alliances are the future of the higher education in Europe. And how proud I am the fact that our alliance is one of the pioneers in this initiative. We started very modest and very slow and very shy, with only two persons involving from our university in year of 19, uh, in year of 2019. And now there are more than 60 people uh, taking part in different activities on daily basis for Circle U only in this university. From small meetings rooms across our universities to fully functionable office in Brussels with several employees that will be open in autumn this year. We are Circle U Alliance with half a million students and 65,000 researchers and teachers. It is not only the size of our alliance that make us stronger, but the vision and strength that we are devoted to. In three weeks, we will be going to Berlin to discuss the future of the Circle U community with other fellow rectors of our alliance. Having in mind the current situation around the globe, we are aware the future of the world is uncertain, but we are on the right path when speaking about higher education and our alliance. Serbia is not a part of the European Union yet, but we, the University of Belgrade, are a part of the EU flagship initiative, the most important one in Europe at the moment, when we seek about higher education, of course. We, a Circle U and the University of Belgrade, were part of several international conferences, networks, and alliances. We had an opportunity to present ourselves to the European, Par European Parliament and very eager to show some of the activities that we are involved in several conferences, meetings, and events. Apart from regular student and staff mobility, Circle U has a very in interesting offer for academics and students alike. From summer schools, student exchange, student challenge, joint courses, thematic seminars, seed founding projects, and yes, we are going to the joint study programs. 
And as the representatives of many European alliances said, why not to the European diploma? There is also an interesting offer for academics too. You can see this in the open calls for different activities on our Circle U web page on the social media. In addition, I have to say that from day one, we have had excellent cooperation and support of the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Science, Technological Development and Innovation of the Republic of Serbia. We are very pleased and honored to see the representatives of the ministries here today, and we are confident that we will have their support for the continuation of this important project. In conclusion, allow me to say that it is my honor and privilege to open the National Conference here in Belgrade, but not, not only the conference with panel discussions and very interesting speakers and guests that we will hear, but other events too that will follow, such as the final event of the Circle U Challenge, the Female Founders Network Workshop, public lectures on global health, just to mention a few of them. I believe that we have prepared a very good academic program that can easily be transformed into the policies. And that is the key. What is the message that we will take with us to our universities, to our faculties, to our departments? What we can do as academics to make the world and our communities a better place? I wish you productive and successful work in the coming days and pleasant state in Belgrade and Serbia. Thank you. Thank you, Rector Djokic, for a very inspiring speech. And as I said, there are more than 190 guests, attendees of this event, roughly 120 here in the room at this moment. All of them are Circle U family, but half of us here are from outside of Serbia. One of them is Secretary General of the Alliance, and I would like to invite Mr. Kevin Guillaume from Belgium to address the audience. Um, dear Minister Begovic, uh, dear Rector Djokic, dear Vladan, uh, dear Assistant Minister, um, dear colleagues and friends, um, I'm very happy to be here and welcome you here, not only at the University of Belgrade, but also, of course, at the University at the Security Alliance. Um, I must confess that I'm really thrilled to be here because uh, the first place that I visited when I started as Secretary General was here. And the first meeting that I, was, uh, that I had was here, basically, with you all. Um, and I kind of feel at home here in Belgrade, and I'm really happy that we are having now the National Conference. As the rector said, uh, it's an important moment uh, for everybody here now um, because uh, we are approaching uh, the, the end of the pilot phase. We have been working hard in the last three years to start working together. And I remember when I was there in September 21, we had a really interesting discussion and not so easy uh, discussion uh, with uh, Melina Krusic, uh, Professor Krusic here. Uh, discussing also about what we will do all together about student-led innovation, for example. And I think that um, it takes time to know each other. It takes time to trust each other. It takes time to know exactly what we will do, because we are nine big university, important university in Europe, uh, excellent university, and of course, we have been uh, working for a long time with, in different networks, different associations, etc. But now we are doing something different. What we are trying to do all together is not only to sign MOUs or try to boost student mobility or something like this. What we are trying to do is really to push a new dynamic in our university. We are doing really good things uh, individually on our university in terms of education, research and service to society. But we believe that the world today needs that we work even closer together. That we want also to change what we are doing all together that we want to make sure that uh, we can uh, really face the challenges that we have. And I'm really happy that the university here decided to work on climate change. I think um, we cannot anymore make, uh, uh, be blind about what is happening in terms of climate. And I think it's really important that all together, the different academics and researchers, we are uh, working together to really give an answer to our policymakers and make the things a better thing, uh, a better world. 
Um, this national conference, as you might know, every non-university of CircleU is hosting a national conference. And I think it's a really an important moment uh, for the university, the hosting university, to connect uh, with, I would say, the national community. And I'm really pleased uh, to have the minister uh, here, the state secretary and the assistant minister, because we realize also that sometimes what is happening in the alliances is not necessarily known by the minister, and you don't have to know everything, of course. But I mean, it's important also to show also what we are doing and maybe show you maybe some obstacle that we have that we could also bring all together and maybe change also uh, the, for example, the legal framework that we have in our nine countries. And therefore, I think it's really good that we can engage uh, all together. And maybe to conclude and uh, following up on what uh, the rector said, um, we know that the context today in Europe and ge the geopolitical context is not easy. Um, and especially, I think, in the relation between the EU and Serbia. But I'm really um, convinced that what we are doing in CircleU can inspire also our policymakers. And I really do hope that we will, uh, it will be inspiring also the trust that we are doing together, the fact that we are working together. Because the University of Belgrade is essential in the Alliance. We need the University of Belgrade. And I hope also that in a way or another, the University of Belgrade will need also CircleU to even be better in what we are doing. And last but not least, I'm, that's why also I was really happy that uh, the CircleU team, and especially I would like to thank uh, Nikola Savic here and uh, his team also that have worked on that, and the vice rector also uh, that have worked on that. I think I'm really happy to see also that you have invited uh, some colleagues, uh, not only institutions from Serbia, but also from the regions, because I think that it could be also a model, the cooperation that we have established to CircleU for the cooperation between uh, the EU and, and the region, and especially in Serbia. Thank you very much, and I wish you a very fruitful meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. As you have heard, we have had uh, substantial help from the Ministry of Education from the first day of the implementation of this project. Therefore, I would like to invite Assistant Minister Ministry of Education, Mr. Aleksandar Jovic, to say a few words on behalf of the Ministry of Education. Thank you. Dear Minister Begovic, dear Rector Jokic, dear Secretary General, uh, dear, uh, dear distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to be here today and to be honored to welcome you all in the behalf of the Ministry of Edu Education. The strategy of development of education of Serbia until 2030 recognized the, the internationalization of higher education in Serbia as one of specific priorities. According to the last, la latest da data, more than 10,000 international students have been enrolled in Serbian higher education institutions. Our strategic goal is to increase this number, uh, attracting students outside of the Balkan. Higher education of Serbia offers internationally recognized quality, um, uh, quality education, especially in the sum of the academic fields. Universities from Serbia are ranked in several uh, prestigious university ranking lists. Since 23, Serbia has been part of the Bologna process, and from 2019, Serbia is fully member of the Erasmus Plus program. In line with that, the Ministry of Education fully supports uh, participation of the University of Belgrade in Circle U University uh, Alliance that have goal to improve our students and staff to mobilize knowledge for impact in order to make the world a better place. I'm convinced that this conference will help students to be part of the uh, academia policy maker cooperation. Now I will shift to the Serbian a little bit. Republika Srbija od 2014. godine učestvuje u programu Erasmus Plus koji se kroz koji se financiraju projekti za razvoj visokog obrazovanja. Zahvaljujući Ministarstvu prosvetu u prethodnom periodu, zajedničkom naporu svih visokoškolskih ustanova i naravno naše nacionalne Erasmus Plus agencije, 2019. godine Republika Srbija, iako nije članica Europske unije, postaje punopravni član Erasmus Plus programa. 
Ovaj program doprinoje u značajnoj meri razvoj visokog obrazovanja u Republici Srbiji. I on je značaj ovog programa više struke ne samo za visokoškolske ustanove i za sve ostale nivoje obrazovanja. Kada govorimo o visokoškolskim ustanovama iz Republike Srbije, učešćem u Razum plus projektima uspeli smo da značajno napredimo visoko obrazovanje, ali da podignemo kapacitete visokoškolskih ustanova ne samo kroz nabavku odgovarajućih nastavnih srstava, već kroz povezivanje naših profesora, sudanata sa kolegama iz Europske unije i naravno šire, u razmeni znanja i kreiranju novih modula, sudijskih programa, novih kurseva. Imajući u vidu da je strategija razvoja obrazovanja i vaspitanja u Republici Srbije do 2030. godine prepoznala i kao poseban cilj postavila razvoj relevantnosti visokog obrazovanja na međunarodnom nivou, te da projekti odobrani pod okrovljem ove inicijative Evropski univerziteti u okviru programe Razvoj Plus značajno doprinose upravo stvarivanja u nacionalnog strateškog cilja. Ministarstvo prosvete od početka podržalo učešće Univerzitetu u Beogradu u ovoj značajnoj Evropskoj alijansi sa partnerima koji stvarno zaslužuju poštovanje. Upravo zbog toga Ministarstvo prosvete je prihvatilo ne samo da finansijski podrži, već i da učestvuje aktivno u ovom projektu. Imajući u vidu da je centralna ideja alijanse formiranje slobodno kretanje studenta, profesora, istraživača, kreiranje zajedničkih politika, zajedničkih studijskih programa, uključivanje jače i uključivanje studenta u donošenje politika i o mogućnosti da oni kroz svoje inovacije doprinesu razvoj visokog obrazovanja, ali i različitih inicitiva, Ministarstvo prosvete podržalo je ne samo Univerzitetu u Beogradu, tome već podržava i ostale univerzitete za priključi sličnim inicitivama. Tema koja se danas obrađuje značajna je sa više društvenih i socijalnih aspekata. I bitno je da zapravo studenti imaju priliku da zapravo svojim znanjem koje su stekli na univerzitetima daju doprinos rešavanju problema klimatskih promjena. Drago mi je da će studenti iz Srbije imati prilike da zajedno sa svojim kolegama iz Vonstranstva čuje ova zanimljiva predavanja i da učestvuje u paralelnim sesijama koje su u nastavku. Želim vam uspešan rad. I wish you grateful... Uh, I'm sure that this conference will help you to go to, 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 to find solutions for the climate changes and to help uh, better internalization of Serbian uh, higher education. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Jovic, and thanks to the Ministry of Education of Republic of Serbia for the constant help. Last but not least, uh, I have a great pleasure to invite Minister of Science, Technological Development and Innovation, Dr. Jelena Begović, to take the floor for the welcome address. Honorable Rector, Professor Djokic, dear State Secretaries, uh, Monsieur Guillaume, uh, dear colleagues, dear students, dear participants, I want to first of all greet you in front of the Ministry of Science, Technological Development and Innovation of the Republic of Serbia and welcome you to the National Conference from Academy to Public Policies with a special emphasis on one of the I have, to tell, I have to say and admit uh, one of the biggest challenges that are in front of our humankind, it's the climate changes and some of the solutions like green and blue infrastructure. Uh, since we don't have a translator and as far as I can see we have a lot of colleagues that do not understand Serbia, I will continue in English. This is the sixth conference with more than 190 participants from more than 10 countries. And this spring, we have gathered here in Belgrade to discuss about global challenges, but also about sustainable and even more complex education for better and more resilient world. And circle you 
is becoming one of the centers and should become one of the centers of gravity for new education and new generations of students who need to provide solutions to global challenges because nowadays everyone is expecting that science will give solutions. That means we need to combine education, research, but also entrepreneurship. The idea of creation of European University as a platform for collaboration will gather all the stakeholders for these big challenges. Students, professors, researchers, civil society, but also business, startups, and public sector. And we jointly have to, jo we jointly have to face these major challenges. Sometimes they are local, but at the end they become global challenges. And we all want to make this planet as a sustainable home and a better place to be. The challenges are numerous. Apart from the climate change, we have challenges in medicine, in agriculture, in food production, environment protection, and energy. And even new technologies are bringing big changes in our everyday lives, like genomic sequencing, which turned medicine into precision medicine with a better prevention, better diagnostics, new ways of drug development, but also application of AI. Although very often without our awareness that it is starting to guide our lives and it's shaping our life. Biotechnology is now merging with IT, it's merging with AI, and it is even starting to change of our own species, and it's changing the evolution of other species. And in parallel, people are establishing another world in metaverse. So, one must, one must ask one question, what is next? how to deal with all the changes, how to regulate, and how to use it for a good cause. The only way to deal and to steer this process and somehow to control it is through changes in education, including introduction of updated methodologies, new programs, new skills, more networking, and more international and multicultural collaboration and then we have to jointly share our knowledge, our ideas, and our solutions. And now back to one of the biggest challenges and the theme of this conference. It's a climate change and green and blue infrastructure. I mean, the climate change is a continuous process from the beginning of the existence of the planet. But today, more than ever, we as a humankind are aware of the power and influence of these processes not only on our everyday life, but on our economies, our health, our environment, and energy. And these processes are determined to a part our future. And this is why we need excellent education, we need scientists, and we need science from different fields in combination with new technologies to start and really to understand these processes and to foresee the consequences and see what is awaiting us in near and far future. And we need a new generation of scientists who know how to do technology transfer, how to do knowledge transfer, and the system that recognizes and supports the entrepreneurship. For this challenge to tackle, one needs new knowledges, new approaches, and new technologies. This is why it's important for educational system to adapt and to create new trends. We need to be at least as fast as the climate change. So one more time, dear guests and participants, I wish you to enjoy, to learn, to collaborate, to exchange ideas, to network, it's very important, and to use this opportunity for the best, for the all of sake of us. 
I want to also use this opportunity, since you may be your, for the first time in Belgrade. Tomorrow at the, uh, the fair in Belgrade, we're opening an uh, international fair for the technology and the technological achievements. And the government of Republic Serbia is representing science and innovations. So you will see how the Serbian science from faculties and from the institute are, is proposing innovative solutions for the global challenges. So please do come if you have time, apart, of course, from this conference. So uh, I guess now that the conference is open, and one more time, enjoy Belgrade, enjoy Serbia, and enjoy this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, Dr. Begovic. Because of their commitments, now we will thank all our distinguished first speakers. Thank you for your presence and your speeches, but we will also invite you to join us at any time during the national conference. For those of us who are staying in the hall, thank you all, Mrs. Minister and professors. For those of us uh, who are staying in the hall, I recommend that you carefully look at the agenda, both, both working hours and interesting activities that you will have in Belgrade, unfortunately, on, the, on these rainy days. But first and most important of all, I would like to ask you to look up to your left, because for the first time we are having live graphic recording. Hello, Daliborka. Daliborka Maldener is the artist, actually uh, catching up uh, the ideas and translating them into graphic pictures, which are here uh, made in traditional, but certainly more valuable and more expensive way, if you wish. Uh, most of graphic recordings nowadays are uh, digital, but uh, Daliborka is doing it by hand. And you will all be um, able to see them at the end of the conference. Good job, Daliborka, thank you. And now I would like to present to you and also to invite Professor Vinicius Mariano de Carvalho to give keynote speech. Let me introduce this extraordinary professor that many of you know. Dr. Vinicius uh, Mariano de Carvalho holds a PhD from the University of Passau in Germany and a BA and MA from the Federal University of Huiz de Fora. Did I say it right? Okay. And about your name? Is Vinicius, okay. <laughs> in Brazil. He is reader in Brazilian and Latin American studies at the Department of War Studies, Vice Dean International for the Faculty of Social Science and Public Policy and was director of King's Brazil Institute for the two past years. He was associate professor for Brazilian studies at Aarhus University in Denmark. He was, that's impressive, a lieutenant in the Brazilian army. And Dr. Cavallo is the Circle U academic chair program coordinator. So he's also a music conductor and currently, currently directs the King's Brazil Ensemble. Impressive. <laughs> Take the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, don't worry, I will not put you to sing. Unless you want, it will be a pleasure to conduct the audience as well. Um, well, uh, I would like to first of all thank very much uh, the University of Belgrade for inviting me to, to be the keynote of this, um, of this conference here. Um, I have been, have been for the first time here last year, uh, here in this country, in this city, in this university. And um, arriving yesterday, I had a, that strange feeling that it is still something new for me, but very familiar already. I think the Germans call that unheimlich. Yeah? So it is, it is like going back home, basically, for a Brazilian to say that. Well, the weather is not exactly the same, but in any case, uh, the, the hospitality that I received here in my first time and now, um, it reminds me that I'm coming back home. So I would like to thank very much the university for this invitation. 
Um, as I said, it's a great honor, but it's also a big responsibility to start a conference like that. And you can't imagine how troubled I was yesterday night trying to figure out how to make this presentation um, strong enough to set uh, the importance of this conference, to, 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 to demonstrate how important this conference is, uh, and at the same time also to provoke some questions here. I don't think I have a lot to teach you. I don't think I have a lot to say that you don't know, but I think I will coordinate some ideas here in ways that probably can help us to think more um, on the topics of this conference and the importance of it. I choose to talk about a region that I know very much, Amazonia region in Brazil. Um, and I will be talking exactly about that. From Academia to Policy, the title of this conference, um, uh, a close look to the projects of development in the Brazilian Amazonia and the consequence to the climate change. Looking at this case example of the Amazonia, that's too big and you'll see why I'm looking and talking about that, we probably can also project that for a more global perspective on the role of policy in, uh, in issues of climate change. I will invite you then to a trip to Latin America, to Amazonia. Let's do. Yeah, and the first image that I have is not so beautiful. It's not what you are imagining, the rivers and the jungle of the Amazonia. That's an image that was in many news in recent days uh, in, all over the world, talking about a big issue that Brazil and Amazonia is suffering recently, and not only recently, since the first colonizers arrived there. It's mining, in this case, illegal mining. I just call your attention to the, pay attention to the truck here, the size of it, and then you can have a dimension of what that represents for the land. Yeah? So the Amazonian region, despite all this beauty and magic that provokes us and provokes our imagination when we think about that, it's also uh, facing very big challenges, and challenges that were not provoked by nature, were provoked by us, human beings, by policy, and also, we should be careful, also because of scholarship. Um, well, let's go and move forward in this trip to the Amazonia. I will start that in England. I will start in Canning House. It's a think tank that uh, looks at Latin America in England. A very important centenary think tank that influenced a lot of policymakers um, and influenced a lot of uh, uh, stakeholders in general when they look in investment in Latin America. Every year they publish this outlook, Latin American outlook 2023, 24, etc. Last year they published the outlook 23. And the key elements that they mention when talking about Latin America are those that we have here. Um, uh, for uh, food and fuel supplies, metals for the energy transition, abundant low cost renewable energy, strand China and West, they are very worried with China nowadays, but let's keep that aside for a while. Distance from the big geopolitical conflicts, strong tradition of democracy and respect for human rights. Wow. Uh, growing environmental awareness. Well, uh, that caught my attention a lot because most of these topics that they defined as the key elements for Latin America in this year are related either to energy, food, or climate. So that shows very much how is in the point in the topic of the agenda. And this awareness, that was curious for me because the next slide that using again the, their, their report, what, what for me was very interesting to notice here is if we compare, um, if we look about uh, the, the concerns, the perception of concerns, um, if we look especially at, uh, sorry, well, let's go there, climate change, the perception in the region, it's almost half of the global perception about climate change as being a, something of concern. So looking at Latin America in particular, it seems that Latin America is not as, as concerned as other parts of the world in which regard climate change. If we look uh, at threats against the environment, again, slightly below the global average of, uh, of worry about that. Huh? Uh, what else we can put in the same category here uh, if we look uh, on, this, on this issue? Even coronavirus, it's less than the, average, the global average. And really, big numbers. It's not just small, uh, small distinctions. Why that is important and why I'm bringing that here? Uh, and let's go now moving to the Amazonia. Let's look about that. So the Amazonian region, it's probably the region of the planet that we can call superlative. Everything there, it's superlative, either to the maximum or to the extreme worse. 
So of course, deforestation in the Amazon is the worst in the planet. Of course, it's the biggest rainforest in the planet as well. Just to give a sense, we can put, I calculated yesterday, we can put 76 Serbias inside that area. That's to give a dimension of what we are talking about when we talk about Amazonian region. The Amazon is a bioma, a big bioma that encompasses nine countries in Latin America in general. Um, all this area in yellow, uh, it's the, the definition that we call Pan-Amazonia. There is also a political, in, inside the country, in Brazil, and I will talk more about Brazil here, sorry for that. Um, inside Brazil, we, we also have a political institution called Legal Amazonia. It's where public policies are directly uh, related to this space. Some of them are outside uh, of what's the, or outside the, the legal Amazonia, and some of them are also outside of the, what is the bioma Amazonia, this green line here. This green line shows very much where we are in deforestation in the Amazonian region. So this Brazil legal Amazonia was defined uh, back in the 50s, and back in the 50s, the jungle came until here. So all this area is deforestation area. Um, and today we can go even further uh, and start to look how this process of occupation uh, is started here. So everything started there when the first Spaniards uh, crossed the Amazonian River. That's uh, Francisco de Orellana that in 1540 managed to come out from Ecuador, from Quito, and God knows how, navigating through the Amazonian River, the Maranhon, Solimões, Amazonian, arriving in the Atlantic Ocean after almost one year, and that's considered when the Amazonia was brought into the attention of the Western world and the European colon colonial world. The only thing Orellana was worried about is to find gold there. Let's find gold. Let's find something that can be profitable. In this small expedition of people, they managed to kill quite a lot of indigenous people in their way, and establishing the possession for the colonial powers here. Later, Portugal was clever and managed to secure Amazonia for basically the, the most part of the Amazonia to the Portuguese empire, let, letting not so much to the Spanish uh, empire at that moment. But again, what I want to show is that uh, when looking at the Amazonian region from the first encounters of colonizers with the region, we're looking in ped predatory terms. It's what we can profit from this region. So the, the construction, the symbolic construction of the Amazonia, it's a construction of a place that needs to be first civilized, second, what we can profit from it. So in the point of view of construction of identity, that's quite important because it's a way that we forged generations of looking at this region. Yeah? That continues. That continues with images of salvage, uh, barbarians, cannibals, that we need to civilize and convert them into what we are. Or also associations with the hell. For many years in my time in the school, we still used to call the Amazonia o inferno verde, the green hell. So it's some place to be avoided or even destroyed if possible. The other hand, there is another mythological look at the region is this paradise. Oh, it's the lost paradise in earth, so finally we found it. So we, man we didn't manage to decide if it's hell or paradise it's still today. But in any case, inimaginable or unexistent spaces indeed. Just results of mythological constructions that damage so much the perception of the region. Well, coming back to the idea of development, the history... Um, First, the, the, the first occupation of the, the colon, uh, colonizers searching for gold. We moved to other, other um, uh, commodities. In the 19th century, um, there was an uh, American engineer who decided to, uh, Hardenburg, Walter Hardenburg, who decided to support the construction of a railway between Brazil and Bolivia. Uh, called Madeira Mamoré, that produced quite a lot of, um, of dead among indigenous people and deforestation in the region, to support the export of a very important commodity for the revo industrial revolution in the 19th century, rubber. So the rubber boom um, was responsible for a massive occupation of the space of the Amazonia, natural trees called seringueiras in the region of the Amazonia, especially in that part close to Bolivia, in what is today Brazil state of Acre, um, was very profitable product. But again, a product that caused a lot of deforestation in the region. The history was being not so nice about that. That is also 
where uh, uh, we had the, the case of the Putumayu rubber exploitation done by local companies, but with their, their shares sold uh, uh, and negotiate in London um, uh, stock market, and that provoked slavery of indigenous people, deforestation, contamination of rivers, uh, and there's a famous, famous report uh, by uh, um, Roger Casement uh, that reported about the atrocities committed in that time. So this rubber became useless after a certain point because it was transported to Southeast Asia, the production of rubber, and then the Amazonia became not necessary for rubber again, just coming back in the Second World War for that. But during that period, look at that. This is Manaus theater the left one, this white, black and white picture. So if you go to Manaus, the capital of Amazonia today, the Amazonia state in Brazil today, you find a fantastic theater, opera theater, made in the, in the, the copy of Milano, La Scala di Milano, where in the 19th and beginning of 20th century, around 1908, uh, ballet and opera companies coming from Europe to perform there uh, to the elites that were exploring rubber, enriching with rubber of the Amazonian region. Um, well, there were other projects around rubber. In 1930, Ford decided to create a city in the Amazonia, Fordlandia, the other picture you have there. Those idea, the Ford ways of production. No? We will plant the trees, explore the, 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 the rubber there, process, produce, and send directly to the car industry. He built up a city in the middle of the jungle, Fordlandia. It's ruins today. They never produce one single kilo of rubber in that project. It was just enough to, again, to provoke deforestation, to change trees that were not native from that specific area to, to other areas, to provoke a lot of evictions and migration inside the region. Just to give you a sense, that's the map of um, a hydrographic map of the, the Amazonian basin. Um, Fordlandia, it's just here. You know, it's just here, 300 kilometers from Santarém, and Manaus is just here. So that's another big project. Again, well studied, very well supported and defined by the political economy, very well supported by policymakers, with a lot of agronomers and uh, scholars that uh, studied agriculture, supporting the plantation of this, of this model of plantation that didn't work. So let's go further. Well, let's look at the Amazon today in terms of climate change and the relevance of the Amazon for the for the world. The first point I want to make here, the, the Conservation International, um, uh, I think tank that is doing quite a lot of work about one concept that I think it's quite important, they are calling that natural capital. I prefer to call environmental capital. And including in the superlativity of the Amazonian region, we can say yes, is the most important part of the planet in a natural capital uh, or environmental capital today. So we have again the map with the, and with quite a lot of maps here. I'm sorry if you get bored with that, but maps are quite good illustrations in this case. So what we have here, we have the, the division between green, yellow, and red Amazon. The green, um, the, the, the Amazon limits, the, the, they are defined by the colors in all countries. So the red Amazon are areas that where the bioma, the rainforest, and are not there anymore because of agriculture, deforestation, or urban space. You can see very easily a south-north pressure on the Amazonian jungle with the this deforestation arc here. That has been used systematically in the last 30 years in Brazil with the expansion of agribusiness, especially plantation of soya beans, maize, and, uh, and also cattle. So we have the yellow Amazon that are those forest and natural ecosystems yet not disturbed by this process of deforestation, but not protect. And the green areas are those protected areas or indigenous lands that are naturally as well protected in the region. Yeah, so what they did, it's a very important study here that shows how much these protected areas, they are relevant for, again, preventing the climate change effects that we are feeling today all, all over the world. So what we have there, for instance, biodiversity priority. Uh, they were capable of mapping uh, how much biodiversity is kept um, around the Amazonian region, where they are very high, high or medium. And the results are 34% of the biodiversity priority areas are 
contained into in the protected areas. So in this mass of the Amazon, 34% is in protected areas. 25% um, in only 25% in indigenous lands, and 50% fall with either category, or, or indigenous land or protected areas. But that means that 50% of the biodiverse areas are unprotected in all Amazonian region, and not only in Brazil, in all other areas. What that represents? That represents a big risk, because being unprotected, they are easily target for the increasing of deforestation for uh, especially, as I said, cattle exploit, uh, uh, production and uh, agribusiness. So, what else is important looking at the region? Carbon stock. Yeah, this is a very interesting map because it shows us um, uh, many undisturbed areas uh, of the central Amazonia is where exactly uh, the rainforest has this power of carbon stock, what is extremely valuable if we think today in a green economy. So we are sitting, or looking in our case, in, a, in a, a very important resource, probably more important than the gold and then the other minor minerals that are hidden underneath of that land. And that's the important aspect that I want to highlight here, is this question of how we can transform what is a passive resource into an active resource, into a capital. Yeah. What else is interesting to look at that? Um, the vulnerability of, uh, of um, uh, deforestation. No? How we can see uh, the parts that, uh, the predicted forest, forest deforestation rate um, is based on, on recent deforestation within a 20 kilometer radius. The most vulnerable areas are roads, rivers, and agriculture frontiers. Yes, it's important to mention to you. I, I have been many times in the Amazonian region, and I just recommend you to do that. Um, well, the Amazonian region, the rivers are the roads. There is no roads. You can't drive around the Amazonian region. There is no railway around the Amazonian region. You either fly or take the rivers. So the main rivers being, being the roads, also in the bank of the rivers, where the regions, the areas where we are more susceptible and more vulnerable to deforestation, because it's where populations occupy uh, the region in general. And again, in those regions that we call the bow, bow of deforestation, that's the expansion of the agri agribusiness in, in Brazilian context. Yeah. So Brazil is today uh, the biggest producer of soya beans in the planet, and expanding with the potential to, to increase more. In Brazil, we can have three harvests per year of soya beans. So that makes, again, a very low-hanging fruit for profitable uh, resource, because it's just plant and will grow. You don't need to do a lot. Yeah. This expansion is provoking a terrible effect in the Amazonian region. Um, the, the water, uh, the rivers of the Amazonia, uh, we, we used to call that we don't have only rivers in the land, in the earth. We have flying rivers in the Amazonia. The bio, the bio system in the Amazon provokes daily uh, evaporation and storms, rainforest because of that, and you probably know that already, but it's just reminding us that. So the amount of water that we see on the rivers of the Amazonia, we used to say that we have the same on the atmosphere of the Amazonia. And this is responsible for the balance of climate in many parts of the world, and not only for the Amazonian region. This is important, a very important element to reduce um, the, the increase of temperature around the world, this cycle of rivers that are flying over the Amazonia. Um, yeah, then there is another map of the potential uh, avoided emissions. So if, if we don't deforestate only these areas, we with the potential uh, emission from deforestation we would stay in 5.45 million tons of CO2 per year, just in this small area that's been more vulnerable for deforestation here. So we are talking about uh, probably the emission that the entire Europe will have uh, as well. Again, importance of fresh water. This is an important map to show now. Amazon is not land, it's water. Sometimes we have a small piece of land there, but most is water. Water, water. It's rain and it's water and it's humid. So, yeah, this, this, is, this is important uh, active there as well. Um, 
And yeah, again, when we look at these water resources, they are sitting most, again, in protected areas. And that's why it's important to keep these areas protected because um, at least 50% of these important areas for uh, freshwater ecosystem, they are also being unprotected due to this deforestation process. And the deforestation process, I mentioned agribusiness, I mentioned um, uh, agriculture in general, but mining has put in a lot of pressure on that as well, especially legal mining, uh, illegal mining of gold. Same thing the Spaniards wanted, we are doing today. But this gold is not staying for the poor people that are exploring that in Brazil. It's not with indigenous people. No. We should perhaps start to ask when we go to buy our rings for getting married, uh, what's the provenience of that gold? Uh, because that's an important political aspect as well. And also, there is another important pressure over mining in the region and many other parts of the world, of course. But um, we have been discussing a lot in UK now that by 2050, all cars will be electric. Yeah, but from where come the minerals to make the batteries of these cars? Is they are not getting in the mines in UK. Yeah. It is, especially in the Chilean region, the second biggest lithium reservoir in the planet is in Chile. And I believe here in, in Serbia as well, you have quite a lot of it, no? So, um, we are discussing important issues that, of course, reduce carbon emission by reducing the consumption of fossil fuel, and then we have electrical cars, fantastic. But where we are pressuring in this ecosystem called planet that is not supporting this transition as we are talking about. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's a beautiful colorful map showing, again, this plurality and the superlativity that I was saying there. It's just, a, it's just an illustration. It's just an illustration, as I said, um, of uh, the biodiversity, the forest carbon stock, the potential emissions from the forestations, fresh water, flow regulation and the climate change, and non-timber forest products that we see all over the region. And again, maps is good, but remember that we are talking about 76 Serbias together in this area. Yeah? Um, despite all of that, oh yeah, the vulnerability for deforestation, as I mentioned before to you, the areas that are more vulnerable, close to the river basin, that's the Amazon River, or on, already in this frontier of deforestation that we saw here. I know that my running out of time, uh, that was just, okay, that's no problem, thank you. I think they didn't like what I'm saying and they're removing the microphone. <laughs> Um, that was a, a, the Guardian, a small video last year about, uh, about the deforestation in the Amazon and the fires of the Amazon region. Yeah, it's good to keep that in mind. It's very good to keep that in mind because it's also very easy to blame Brazil or blame Brazilians or other Latin American countries because of that. But what we tend to forget is that this didn't start from today. That was a policy, a state policy. In 1953, during Vargas' government in Brazil, was created a um, superintendence for um, exploitation of the Amazonian region. Later, in 1966, was created the superintendence of the development of the Amazonia. And what they pretend to do, that's SUDAM, Superintendência para o Desenvolvimento da Amazonia. And look what was, I'm just showing images. Look what they said here. Amazonia today, uh, sorry, yesterday, today, tomorrow. That was what the state saw for the region. So a jungle that will be put down and industrialized. Yeah, that was the vision of development that started in the 50s. And it didn't stop here in just one magazine that promoted the policies of the Amazon. Uh, land was distributed for those who wanted to go there and implement new initiatives, especially industrialization. A region was called Zona Franca de Manaus, a free trade zone in Manaus in the capital to industry, to establish their, their plants, not paying taxes at all, yeah, so to increment the industrialization of the region. And all the magazines in the, in the period were showing things like that. Rondon is one of the states that suffer more from deforestation in the Amazonian region. Uh, and the, 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 that says in Portuguese, a luta contra a selva, the fight against the jungle. That's the language used here. Or, Para unir os brasileiros, nós pegamos, rasgamos o inferno verde. So, to unite Brazilians, we stretch, we, we broke the, the green hell. Yeah, that's the mentality. It's bringing roads, people, industrialization, more. 
a land zone for you to find your gold mine, yeah? suggesting and proposing the, the mining exploitations. And all of that, Minister of Interior, Superintendents of Development of Amazonia, Bank of the Amazonia, yeah? stop with legends. Let's make money. That's the, the other one. Stop with legends about indigenous people, etc. Let's make money. And the picture of the Amazonia as an industrial plant there. Or the north of the Amazonia. We here, we won against the jungle. The jungle starts to be de de depicted as the enemy. And I'm showing that because why this is important? Because this is public policy. This is not advertisement. It's not propaganda of a group or other. That's public policy implemented by the state, supported by agents of the state, and also supported by a lot of academic studies. Political economists, sociologists, anthropologists, um, uh, uh, politologists, um, engineers, geologists, all of those scholars were there also in support of this mentality of development. So that's something that I want to to bring to this discussion for us today, to call how important and responsible is our work today. Because in the past, we also supported agendas like that one. Yeah. So I am coming to the end and the conclusions of my talk here that, as I said, is probably not so um, organized. But at least we make this trip around the Amazonia and looking that the problems that we are facing today in climate change and the risks imposed under the Amazonian region, they didn't come from today. They are a result of a strategic communication process from a state that decide and supported by other, uh, by other states. One of those posters said, uh, this will pass through London, talking about the banks that would sponsor that. So that was a collective economical endeavor that scholarship supported that as well. Our responsibility, and that's why I think my responsibility as well to, to talk in this opening uh, activity here, it's, it's big because we have at our hands such a strong and responsible uh, action to do. First of all, is how we can translate what we are doing in research in terms of climate change and in terms of environment to public policies that will be not only mitigate what has going on, but also to help to change this perception and this, this mentality that the places like the Amazon are there to be, to be exploited. The previous president of Brazil last year in a very misogynist comment, he said, the Amazon is like a virgin girl. I don't complete what he said because it would be too much for this audience. But you can imagine it coming from a misogynist person. So we need to understand how can we look, how can we look to this space of the world, this immense space of the world that plays such an important role to the balance of the environment that we have and plays an important role in the control of the climate change with our scholarship, but a scholarship that will influenciate policymakers, any stakeholders, politicians, but also transform that in a communication, strategic communication way that can change the mentality that we saw in the beginning. If Latin American population don't see climate change as a problem as we are seeing, then there is a lack of communication here. If that's not an issue there where people are living, then we need to look at that very geopolitically carefully. I will stop here. I thank you very much again for the opportunity of sharing these ideas with you. I hope that these ideas will provoke thinking and provoke discussions among us here. And again, my most deep thank you for Belgrade University for inviting me to open this, uh, this uh, conference. And I'm sure within CIRCOU, we have quite a lot of opportunities to make this dialogue between policymakers, scholars, and community in general, and new generations of students. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Cavallo. Very interesting, very original lecture. We will have also time later during the panel discussion to talk a bit more. But now I would like to invite Professor Abraham Mandelson from the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, for the second keynote speech. 
Avi Mendelssohn is a professor at the CS department Technimon and an IEEE fellow. He has industrial and academic experience in various areas, such as computer architecture, hardware security, hardware accelerators, and architecture for machine learning. He graduated from the CS department Technion, BCS 1979, and MCS 1982, and got his PhD 1999 from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Among his industrial jobs, he worked for 11 years as a senior computer architect and principal engineer at Intel. He managed for four years the academic related activities for Microsoft, R&D Israel, focusing on students' innovation and research collaborations. He served as a PI in various EU projects, among them the Eurolab for HPC, aiming at helping researchers to transfer their innovative ideas to successful startups. Professor Avi Mendelssohn has published more than 130 papers in referred journals, and he holds more than 30 USA patents. He was a member of the ACM Europe Council team for the IEEE Computer Society Board of Governors, BOG, and served as a second VP. Currently, manage the Computer Society Israeli chapter in Israel. Professor Mendelssohn, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. We are running out of time, so I'll try to do it uh, quite short to be on time, sort of. And uh, I will focus mainly on the, the process and about innovation. This is the main uh, topic for my talk uh, today. Uh, I just want to mention uh, that I have some hobby that about every five years to jump between industrial and academia, between software and hardware, etc., which is a lot of fun, but I think that it gives a lot of experience in terms of uh, entrepreneurship and uh, the ability to uh, deal with uh, a complex environment. So, the first point that I want to mention is uh, what prevents students usually from going from their great ideas to uh, interpretive uh, startups, etc. So as you probably know in Israel, we have a lot of startups and it is quite common. I found out that in many other places there are much less. And part of it is a matter of uh, culture. There are places even in Israel when you look on communities, there are communities that prefer to a place which is more stable to be in a, a big places and not to a, a, in a small places. And uh, the second one is a, a matter of a work-life balance, especially for women which are more sensitive, but I think that the new generation is more sensitive to, to this. When you go to startup, usually uh, it demands uh, to, to devote almost all your life uh, at that period of time to, to the startup. So many people don't like to start the process. The other things is that there are many people who fear to fail. And we know that uh, the probability of a startup to success is 10 to 20%, that's all. So most likely most of the, uh, the startup will fail eventually. There are many people that because they fear to fail, they don't start the, 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 the process. There's all the issue of the self-image and public image, etc., etc. but what I want to focus is about the tools that we are giving them 
And what we try to do in most of these uh, programs is to give the student the feeling that uh, in a relatively secure environment, they can actually exercise their uh, ideas and to see how good they are. Hopefully that after uh, having this experience, they will try it for real in the real world. So I put together what I call a taxonomy of innovation uh, programs, and actually it's not the entire innovation programs. These are the innovation programs that I was involved with. And in general, I divided them into three categories, different courses, innovation summer schools, and hackathons. And I will extend a little bit about each one of these uh, categories. Uh, 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 what are the trade-offs and why we are doing it? Let's start with courses. So in general, there are two kinds of innovation courses. Almost every university teach a course in innovation. Fortunately or unfortunately, most of them are focusing on the process to explain to the student you should do A, B, C, D, and if you are lucky, you will have a startup. Uh, the other type of courses are courses that try to encourage the student to start the process itself, which is totally different than to understand the process, but it is to do it for something to imitate the reality. So for the first trend, there are many, many courses. And actually, as part of the EU, uh, it was mentioned a project that was called HPC uh, for a uh, Euro Lab for HPC. The EU actually gave us money in order to develop programs to encourage innovation and actually to pay a, a small sum of money uh, to some selected project to start with. And uh, the idea was actually to mentor uh, uh, this uh, 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 group so it will not be just the money, but also the mentoring uh, 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 of the program. It ran for, in two rounds for three or four years. I think that was relatively a, a, a good success. A few of them became actually uh, companies later on and uh, more details are in the link that okay, I think that you can hardly see. Anyhow, out of uh, uh, this uh, program, we developed a program that was called Business Prototype for Research. And this program actually run uh, by Professor Per uh, Stoltum from uh, Sweden. And, uh, but we run it uh, quite a few times. With, there are a lot of materials in this uh, course, and the, uh, again, it explains all the process starting from you have an idea, you need to go to the customer, you need to, to have a survey, you need to understand that what you are offering is good or bad, uh, etc. And this is again the customer uh, uh, discovery, then to go to VCs, etc., or some people who knows the market. It is not enough that you know the market. You know to get advices to be escorted by somebody who better know the market. And we developed the entire program. We ran it a few times. It was easier when it was supported by the EU, but maybe your organization want to do something similar. If you, and to at least to choose few groups that want to process, uh, to, to do the process, and actually to help them using experienced people, using mentors, and help uh, uh, good ideas, at least to try the process. I think that this is a very good uh, 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 way to proceed. A different uh, uh, attempt uh, was a course that uh, actually I built up and I run it a few times, and right now we are going to, to renew it at the Technion. We call it technology for society. Or oh, the underline was your first startup. The idea was that society usually, a problem with society, students really like. And everybody has some idea to have the society. 
So take this motivation, but the idea was that we will not tell the student what are the project. We taught the student few technologies that we thought that these are important technology. That time, for example, it was smartphone, it was the cloud, and it was a camera, kinetic camera, or something like that. But it can change. Right now we are considering uh, to take uh, machine learning and uh, a few other tools which are common. We gave them as part of a class, and this was a, credit, a class with credit at the university. We gave them talks about so, uh, 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 problems in the society. We brought people who are volunteer uh, uh, in helping the elderly people. We brought people from other departments, usually from uh, the techn is technical university. So we brought people from hyper university that have uh, social uh, 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 studies, etc., to tell what are the, 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 the problems. We brought these people with disabilities. And again, we didn't tell them what project to take. We just tell them these are the problems. And now the first challenge was that the student will innovate and come with an idea that, the, that fits to the, to the class. So instead of telling or giving a list of a, a, a project, we gave them a list of problems. So the idea was the uh, uh, following. We define the society as something, any person, or something that you can help. You want to help your dog is OK. It doesn't need to be a person. But you need to have a target. You need to have something that we can actually refer to. And then you need to interview the, the, either the person or the owner or something like that and define the, 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 the project. The first step was to have an interview with the object of the, 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 the idea and to come and define what is your project. We, pro we actually make them pass all the process like every startup. So we have the committee that suppose that we are the, 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 the uh, VCs, suppose that we, are, uh, that we need to give you money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We took a process and they had to pass all the process and in the end, they had to come with a, a PLC, proof of concept. And we interview again the one that we interviewed at the beginning to ask, does it help you? So this was the process. It was, it could be a one semester, usually we prefer the, a, to take it for a, a early course. We have more than 10 projects uh, over two, uh, uh, two years with three universities. As I said, we are going to renew it uh, uh, soon. And uh, some of the students actually took ideas from the examples that we gave them. The interesting part was that many of them just say, okay, we got the, 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 the principal, but we want to do something else, and it was fine with us. We had a student that wanted to help his neighbor that his son has uh, disabilities. We had a student that his girlfriend uh, uh, do uh, uh, some uh, uh, medical things, and he wanted to, to help her. So, but w each one of them took some real problem, something that really had them and they want to, 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 to solve. And we got excellent uh, 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 result. Uh, some of them were not really uh, uh, society like, in some sense the, it is helping to find a free parking lot or things like that, but it is okay. You know that this is a real problem and you take a real problem, you can judge if it helped the people, and then the end of the day, you can check that your solution is valid. And this was a, 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 the main idea. So, few words about uh, innova uh, Innovation Summer School. Is innovation Summer School, uh, I'm just looking on the time, because I'll try to be approximately on time. Okay. So Innovation Summer School is a very good uh, opportunity. I mean, when I work 
in the Microsoft because Microsoft wanted to get the best uh, students, so they have a lot of uh, summer school for gifted uh, uh, students, but there are other formats uh, for summer school in Europe. Uh, some of them are focused on a, a specific topic, some of them are a, a, a more general. The, so in, in the summer schools, uh, actually we had the opportunity to make a few experiments. Uh, so, some the, again, sometimes we uh, took people that has the same background. Sometimes we try to choose people with different background. Sometimes we take a, a group that uh, 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 they will develop the entire program. Sometimes we break the complex program to parts and do some kind of pipelining. So we could actually examine different models. Regardless what the model was, always the best teams were people that were heterogeneous. Usually when you take people from different backgrounds, you benefit. When you take people with the same background, you end up getting more of the same. When you get uh, people with different background, the learning curve is a little bit uh, harder or, or longer, but at the end of the day, when they start speaking the same language, so you benefit the good of all the, 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 the team, so always, and we found out the heterogeneity and different backgrounds usually help. And again, it can be different gender, even political orientation in Israel is very sensitive. Once we did a, a project that we took a student from the West Bank and from the Palestinian area and mixed them with a student from Israel. Sometimes we, we, we talk from people what they consider to be strong a, a, a part of the society and weak part of the society. It doesn't matter how you mix it. At the end of the day, you win. And this is, I think, a very important uh, message if you want to, to, to get something meaningful. Uh, uh, maybe uh, the, the learning curve or the beginning is a little bit slower, but at the end of the day, the variety always helps. The the last part, uh, uh, which is more common in uh, uh, many universities, are the hackathons. The hackathon usually is one or two days. You gather people. By the way, again, uh, usually heterogeneity helps here, but uh, now it is a little bit more tricky because you have a, a relatively small uh, time to do it, so you sometimes want to be more focused. But even in hackathons, we saw that as soon as the group start to work together, the, the heterogeneity works. So there are a few models to, to, to hackathon. Sometimes it is more technology uh, uh, focus. So for example, recently, I think that this is the next slide. Uh, never mind, I'll, uh, 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 I'll skip the exact uh, uh, slide. So sometimes you, you, you want to promote technology. For example, recently we had a, a hackathon on Risk Five, which is a kind of processor, and we want the student to, to, to work with this technology. You could have a, 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 some a hackathon on machine learning or something like that. Many times we just give a, 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 the area, which, for example, a, a medical solution or something like that. The reason that usually you don't see open a hackathon, which is much wider, is because it is very difficult to rank the, 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 the project at the end of the day. The important part is, again, to this time, even if you are not involving different type of student, you want to involve people from industry, at least as a mentors, and people from the academia. You want to, 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 to give the, the, the student the, the, the feeling that it is important. 
And extremely important that the prices of the judges will be people that the, the student consider them as potential employers. Because in that case, they try to do their best in order to do the best uh, job, the, the best work, hoping that they will be uh, elected. By the way, many times for students uh, to promise as a pri first and second prize, etc. summer internship was the more than uh, uh, just the money to go and do something. For companies, it is a win-win because they get the best uh, uh, student, etc. So I'll jump to my conclusions. My conclusion is that innovation is extremely important. It's, uh, in particular, we didn't have time to go into this, but uh, we are, it is not just a technology uh, a change. We are in an era that I think that we are in a major uh, a change. It is not just the, the chat GPT and so on, but it is all the AI era, which actually many people consider it that the machine or somebody will make the decisions, which is extremely uh, uh, dangerous. Uh, I have another talk about this. I will not go into uh, 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 this topic at uh, uh, that moment, but innovation is one of the places that you can use AI. Uh, you can use all these tools, but you need to, 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 to contribute. You need to do something uh, 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 that you contribute to it. I think that we need to train students to ask questions. This is very, very, very important and to doubt on any fact that we tell them. By the way, there, 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 there is a, a very, about 20 years old a, a paper from the MIT education course that what they propose, which is genius, but nobody implemented it uh, ever, to put in any chapter in the, uh, in the textbook something like three to five mistakes. But right in the, uh, uh, the head of the chapter, in this chapter, we intentionally put two mistakes, three mistakes, etc. Now the point is that the student will be forced every equation and, and uh, any fact that you present to check if it is the true one or if it is the false one. So it is not that by mistake there is. Intentionally we put mistake in order to, uh, for you to be alert that you cannot trust uh, 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 all the facts which are in the chapter. Intentionally or not intentionally, we need to make the students think that everything that we teach them, they need to reconsider. Many times there are things that were true in the past and we are continue to teach it, but it is not true anymore because the things change. And maybe many times we're even not aware that we are not teaching the right things. The students need to be aware that they need to check every uh, uh, fact or any assumption that we are uh, uh, making. And the last but not least, I think that we need somehow, I don't know how, but somehow to teach them that you fell on something only if you fail to understand the root cause of the, the, the failure. By the way, I think personally that you fail also if you have a great success and you don't understand why you succeed, next time you try to do it and you will fail. So I think that you need to do a post-mortem to understand the root cause of success and failure. And this is the, the, the major point. But the point is that you don't need to, if you fail, and you understand it, it is a success. This is a great success. When I was in Intel, and I was uh, uh, mostly in the, I was half of the time in the research, half time uh, in the product. We used to have what we call uh, uh, celebrating the, 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 the failures. So it is not that we were happy to, that something hap uh, bad happened, but if something bad happened and the group did a great job, but 
because something changed, because of something, they, they, maybe because of commercial reason, they decided to close it. We used to give a promotion and prizes to the team to tell them you did a great job even though the project was canceled. This is extremely important in order to uh, uh, explain to the student that it is always try to be the best, always try again and again. If you believe in something, always try it again and again. At the end of the day, you will benefit out of it. So, I let you to go to lunch, unless you have uh, questions. Thank you. Any questions now for Professor Mendelssohn or later? Yes? First of all, my experience, and I can tell only my experience, is in the scientific and the technology. But I believe that uh, it is beneficial almost to any society, and uh, it is not just to, to a, a technology. If you even look on management of uh, banks, for example, usually they used to bring only their friends and then because the law forced them to put more women and to put more representative of the, uh, uh, the general uh, society, they find out that have a second opinion, things again, it always helps. So in many, many uh, areas, uh, you find it very beneficial. I can give another example that even in the uh, army, Right now, in the intelligent army in Israel, they have a group of people that their job always to present the opposite opinion uh, uh, than their managers. So they know that this is their job. It doesn't matter if they believe or not, they need to come with all the evidence that the opposite would happen. And the reason is that uh, people that believe in something tend to bring only the evidence that they support the idea, and eventually it is not good because you are missing a lot of things. Now, if you have a team that this team need all the time to think opposite to what you think, they try to find out what you miss. In security, we are doing the same. There is what uh, uh, they call the black team, the black team try all the time to find what is your, the weakness of your system. This is their job, not to find out if you did uh, 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 all the, the regular procedure, but to find out if you missed something. Now, when you have for almost any subject, if you have people that know that it is eligible to say something which is opposite, now, and it will not affect the promotion or the respect the people give them or their salary, you find out that at the end of the day, it benefits to, to, to the organization. The only problem is that usually managers don't like to hear it. But this is a different story. <laughs> Okay, if you want to approach me over lunch or later on, you're welcome. I think that everybody's thinking about the black team and can you borrow us, some of them, <laughs> maybe, to implement that idea first. Thank you very much. You. Now, um, allow us to invite you. Thank you, Professor Mendelssohn. Now, allow us to invite you to lunch, which will be served in the hall where you pick up your cards uh, and you can also use our beautiful courtyard in the building. I have to note that the month of May in Belgrade is usually much more pleasant when it comes to weather and much warmer, but it is obvious that the weather is gently guiding us towards working and working in these three days, but um, I, I believe that you will have at least one brighter day. When you are at lunch, please 
pay attention to the clearly marked uh, vegan and vegetarian foods. So see you again here at exactly 2.30. Thank you very much and pleasant lunch.